Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, ALEC National Chairman, Arizona Senate President, Karen Fan. Good morning. Everybody have a really good night at their state's nights or whatever you did last night. Yes? Great. Good to know that. We have a tremendous lineup of speakers this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce to the stage to a man who needs no introduction here in Georgia. He previously served as the 81st governor of Georgia from 2003 to 2011. 
the first Republican to hold the office since the Reconstruction era. Most recently, he served as the 31st United States Secretary of Agriculture from 2017 to 2021. He is now currently the Chancellor of the University System of Georgia. Sorry. Please join me in welcoming Governor Sonny Perdue, who will lead us in opening prayer and provide us with inspiration to start your day. Would you please help us welcome Governor Perdue? Please, those days are over. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you, President Fan, and it's a delight to be here to, this morning and to welcome you, first of all, to our capital city of Georgia. And uh, I trust from the temperature, you all have had a very warm welcome here. So, uh, and I trust also on the line today that you saw our southern, southern version of hash browns, those grits out there. So please take advantage of those as well. But uh, it's good to be here with Alec, uh, President Fan. I'm I just uh, delighted to find that a political organization still wants to have an invocation in today's culture, and that's important. <clears throat> While many people don't like to talk about it, but I think we understand the founding of our nation and the principles upon which it was founded, the Declaration of Independence, which many people are trying to tear down today, and uh, it's just a delight to be here with an organization that understands the pr principles of freedom, faith, all the kinds of things that have made this country the, the best in the whole world. So thank you all for what you do individually, respectively, in your own states. And thank you. As this republic was conceived, your jobs are, are so important as the states are laboratories of policy across the, uh, across the country, what you do in your individual states, whether in the majority or minority, is, is infinitely important to the role of this nation in the world today. And as this great republic continues to, uh, uh, to move along, you know we have many challenges. That's why we have to double down and stand strong for the faith that we have in, uh, in our lives, in our nations, in our capitals across the country, and in our legislators. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you for the policies. I've seen the, uh, the headline of all the, uh, the policies that you're undertaking. And again, for the freedom of the world, from the freedom of our nation continuing, I, I trust that you will continue to stay by the stuff and to work hard in order to pursue the goals and the principles that Alex stands for in so many ways. Now, if you don't mind, we will uh, bow our heads and thank the Lord for, first of all, our food, for our country, for our freedom, for its leaders. We'll pray for you all, his leaders here, our national leaders, and the, and the world stage. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we come to you acknowledging you, the creator and sustainer of the world. Father, we call upon you today to, to bless the United States of America. Father, we know that we have fallen so far away, but we just ask, God, that you uh, have mercy upon us as a nation. Lord, bring us to the point of reconciliation with you and, and your principles that have guided this country for over 200 years. We thank you for the founders of this nation, the principles upon which they formed this nation, and God, that we pray that we would return to many of those freedom principles that have enabled the United States of America to be a beacon of hope around the world for so many, many years. God, give us grace, give us peace. Lord, we pray for these men and women in this room today, those who've left their homes, their businesses, their families to do the public's business. God, I know these from the outside seem like glamorous jobs, but we know them, Father, to be sacrifices. And I pray for each person and their colleagues that are in their own individual states that you would strengthen them in their courage as these men and women could go back and be influencers in their own legislators over the principles of freedom and, and independence that 
represent the United States of America. Father, I pray that you would embolden them, strengthen them, guide them by your light. Father, we thank you for each one. We pray for our national leaders, for our United States Congress, for our president and his cabinet, Father, that you would give them wisdom, not only wisdom, but the courage to act upon the wisdom that you would provide in a way that honors you in, in so many ways. God, I just ask that you would give this convention a very successful meeting as they learn from one another, as they learn from the speakers. God, help us to hear the words that you could use that would give us the wisdom to continue in the jobs that you called us to do. May each person here stand in the place in the, of the point of the wall where you've appointed them. Stand for righteousness, stand for freedom in this world today. Bless our food today, fathers. We thank you for those that have produced it, that have prepared it, for served it. And we thank you for these servers that so graciously provided our, our nourishment today, Father. And as we think about the food that we've consumed, may it be a metaphor for the, for the sustenance that we need from you each and every day as we go forward in our lives. And may we remind us of the dependence that we have upon you in all of our lives. In your holy and precious name we pray, amen. Please welcome back to the stage, Karen Fan. Thank you, Governor, for those wonderful words. And yes, it is always nice to have an organization truly believes in opening with prayer every day. So thank you for that. We appreciate all that you have done, Governor, um, to serve our country and all that you are currently doing to strengthen the education system in Georgia. All of us are eagerly awaiting the upcoming midterm elections. As we all know, it can sometimes be difficult to make sense of the avalanche of polling data and messaging spin that is generated on a daily basis. Our next guest is an expert on understanding and interpreting that data. Scott Rasmussen has long been recognized as one of the world's leading public opinion pollsters and politi political al analysis. In 1990, Scott created the first ever daily presidential tracking poll and revolutionized the public polling. Today, he is the president and CEO of RMG Research, Inc., providing data-driven insights to clients and policymakers. In providing this analysis, Scott relies upon his trademark technique known as counter-polling. It's a way of getting to the heart of what voters are really thinking by asking the questions in a language and context that voters can understand. The Washington Post has called him a driving force in American politics, and the Wall Street Journal described him as a key player in the contact sport of politics. Early in his career, he co-founded ESPN, the cable sports news network. Rasmussen, who has never lived in D.C., is married and has two grown children. Would you please join me in giving a warm Alec reception to Mr. Scott Rasmussen. You know, that never living in Washington part is really important because when you don't live in Washington, you hear what people really talk about. And while it's not as dramatic between a state capital and your folks back home, it's really important to remember that we live in a bubble. Uh, I want to start with a very simple premise. I look at a lot of data, probably as much as anybody on the planet. I look at polls, some that I agree with, some that I conduct, some that I grumble about. But what comes through loud and clear to me is that America's best days are still to come. I am very optimistic by what I see in the data. I know that my kids, and if I'm ever lucky enough to have grandchildren, will live in a better world, partly because the American people are still committed to those founding ideals of freedom, equality, and self-governance. Sometimes it's hard to see, and look, we're going through tough times as a nation right now, 
But voters are making the adjustment. When we talk about the pandemic that our leaders said could not have come from a lab leak in Wuhan, China, a majority of voters overwhelmingly say, yes, that's the first place we should look. They're also very skeptical. In fact, a majority of voters, 57 percent, say they think our government not only helped fund some of that, but helped cover it up. So there is a continuing skepticism about government, and that means they're also skeptical of every legislator in this room. And that's a good thing. You should be prepared to have people challenge you and wonder about where, which side you're really on, and you should strive to live up to their trust. Uh, another reason that I'm really optimistic, we've talked a lot about education at this conference. A couple of years ago, before the pandemic, if I asked about homeschooling, it was treated as a pariah topic. It was those things that crazy Christians did, but it wasn't really good for the children. Today, after people went through two years of actually seeing what went on in schools, homeschooling is considered a very viable option. Not only that, 40% of parents who have kids in public schools say they're open to considering other options. Pretty encouraging. Now, not all 40% are going to switch. Not all would go to homeschooling. There are charter schools, and there's pods, and there's all kinds of things out there. But parents are beginning to recognize that they have that choice. When we talk about something like education, though, our tendency is to go right for the details. And some people in this room have probably complained about the teaching of critical race theory, or CRT, in their schools. And that's a good thing to complain about. But you should never talk about it that way to anybody outside of this room. And the reason for that is voters do not know what CRT means. Voters, only 8% of voters talk politics on a daily basis. They are not familiar with the code words that we use. They don't like the substance of what critical race theory is, but they don't know the terminology. So as you go out and begin to talk about messaging, you have to begin to focus on what the listener is expecting, the terms that they use. And again, that's why I live outside of DC. Um, every now and then, my wife and I play uh, music in a dive bar called the Whistle Stop Bar and Grill. And I will tell you, you learn more about public opinion at the Whistle Stop than you do at a convention like this. Uh, that's just part of life. You have to be able to connect with people who are speaking a different language. Uh, what the American people are committed to is freedom, equality, and self-governance, but they need our help to make that a reality, to restore that in America. There's encouraging things happening in the state of Arizona with, with education. There's encouraging things happening in the state of Virginia where there's a pivot being made from protest to governance. But we still need to think about ways to talk about all of our issues. And I want to start by picking on freedom, uh, excuse me, federalism, limited government, and freedom, the, the mottos of ALEC. I think they're wonderful. If you leave this conference thinking that you need to convince people that those are what we're fighting for, you've already lost. The reality is those are principles that we know are important. That's the, the inner workings of how to create a good society but it is not the way you're communicating what we're doing. The difference is, and a lot of policy wonks do this, um, if a policy wonk was selling Diet Coke, they would read the list of ingredients on the back. This is what Diet Coke is. A marketing person would say, this is this great refreshing drink, it's good for you, it doesn't have all that sugary stuff. Now the two have to work together. The marketing person has to convince people it's worth trying and worth enjoying, but the policy people have to back it up and actually make it work. In the political sense, what that means, freedom, limited government, federalism, those are the ingredients. But nobody cares about government. They don't care about limited government. The objective is not to create a government that works. It is to create a society that works. So when you go out and talk to people, you need to start from a premise of what matters to them. Last year, there was a, an effort by the Biden administration to pass what they called the Build Back Better bill, 
which was a mouthful. Alec uh, worked with us and with about 64 other uh, organizations on the center-right coalition to fight that bill. And one of the things that we did early on was we looked at things that we thought would upset voters about it. And one group came up with a list of 42 offensive provisions in that bill. And I'll bet that if I shared all 42 with you, you would say they're offensive too. We went and polled on them, and about 36 of them were not offensive to the American people. So things that were bothering this group, that would bother you, that were bothering the coalition we were working with, didn't matter. Now, some people, they hear things like that, and they say, we need to explain to them why they're offensive. Well, that's, that's good, that's logical, but when you're talking to an audience that rarely talks politics, and you have their attention for only brief moments of time, a better way to approach it is to focus on the six things that did offend people. And that's what we did. We talked relentlessly. Every organization that was part of this coalition reached out talking about some of the six items that moved it. And by the way, we thought we were doing great until Joe Manchin betrayed us a couple of days ago. Um, but that effort was focusing on the issues that people were cared about, not the issues that we cared about. That's the, me that's the key to any effective messaging. Over this weekend, we're going to be doing some testing on the new bill that's coming out, and we're going to go back and do that exact same thing. So we're going to be talking to people, asking them what they care about, what offends them about this bill, and then we're going to make sure, especially that uh, Senator Sinema and a few others are aware of what is troubling the American people about this. Always, always, always keep in mind what voters want to talk about. If education is your top issue, it's a great issue for Republicans this year. But talk about it, not in the narrow sense of critical race theory or something else, talk about it in the way that will, draw, that will attract the biggest audience. Talk about it as we want parents to have more control. I'm gonna take questions in a minute, but I'm gonna do something that I can safely say nobody it has ever done before at an ALEC conference. I am going to say that you should follow the model of Bill Clinton. In the 1990s, Bill Clinton worked on welfare reform. He had a way of framing it that 90, I've never seen a poll like this before or since, 90% of the voters agreed with Bill Clinton's statement. Now, when I followed up, they all thought it meant something different. But he had a unifying way of getting a message across. When we apply that to the issues of today, if you talk about, well, the problem with schools is the standards are too low, or the problem with schools is the transgender issue, or the problem with schools is CRT, you're only getting a small fragment of that appeal. You want to talk about the bigger issue, which is parents are the ones who should direct the education of their children. Parents are the ones who should be passing on these values. If you do that, you might not get to the Bill Clinton 90% level, but you'll be pretty close because that is a driving force in American politics. Uh, we have one great opportunity before us in this nation today. For most of my life, People on the political right have been identified with freedom. People on the political left have been associated with equality. And they're seen as butting heads, and it's kind of been a draw. In today's world, the political left is abandoning equality. They're moving to equity. Our movement to go forward and becoming a governing majority should become the movement of freedom and equality. Both values are there. Both values resonate with the American people, and the field is wide open. We should find a way to capture that. And by the way, that's the way you make sure that government of, by, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Uh, if there are any questions, there's some microphones roving, roaming somewhere. If I don't like the question, I'll pretend I didn't hear it. Some 
Your polls that you conduct seem to be amazingly accurate. Is there a specific methodology that you have that uh, makes it so? Polling methodology is a topic that I could stand here and bore you with for about three hours. Um, one of the keys is making sure you reach a good, a good sample of the population and talk to them in ways that they are used to communicating. Um, you know, it used to be you'd call people on the phone, then answering machines got in the way, then these cell phones came along. And truly, think about this. If I were to call my kids on a cell phone, the first thing they'd say is, what's wrong with mom? Because nobody talks that way anymore. So we reach people through apps, we reach people through text, and then it's not so much the poll that is problematic, it is the way you interpret it. Uh, we just did a poll in Colorado, Senate race poll, and we looked at the margins, but the key detail was that among people who were undecided, 82% of them disapprove of President Biden. You look at that and you say, that means this race is gonna be a lot closer than the polls indicate right now. Polls are a really helpful tool if they're well done, but don't expect them to be, tell you um, precisely what's gonna happen. In Utah 4 in 2020, I, my last poll of the race shocked me and everybody else. It showed Burgess Owens winning by one point, and Burgess was kind enough to win by one point to make my poll look good. <laughs> but the fact is that poll had a three and a half point margin of error. It was not the tool to tell you who would win a one point race. It was the tool to tell you it would be close. Yes. Hi, Scott. Lee Habib, Vice President of Content at Salem Media Group, and thanks for all you do and how you do it. Um, you talked about polling and message. What about narrative and the sub-theme of uh, story and themes? Um, talk about those things. Sure. Um, numbers are really good to a data geek like me because I can look at numbers and they tell me a story. And I long ago learned, like Lee suggests, that uh, most people don't relate to numbers. You, one of the things we talked about with the Build Back Better bill is never say it's trillions of dollars. That's the reason to vote against it. You have to connect with people on things that will make a lasting impression. You have to put your story into the narrative. When you're talking about a policy issue, um, it's not the dynamics, it's not the ingredients of the policy, it's how it will affect somebody's life. And then if you can put it into the narrative of how it helps the community life, into that storyline, well, that becomes even better. And if you can connect your policy, not just to why it'll make your community better, but how it taps into America's founding ideals, well, then you've got a real winner, again, because that connects with voters. One of the things that uh, was mentioned in my intro was that I do what I call counter-polling, and that is simply a way to support storytelling in the way the American people would tell the story. Because most polls, when they ask about topics, they ask about the words as they're used in Washington, D.C., most voters don't use those words. So we try to put things in, again, a different language that connects with the experience of everyday Americans. Is there one more? I'm with the Stop Inflating Us, and there's a few people in the country that are worried about inflation this cycle uh, and how the federal debt might be driving that further. How do we uh, cover that issue with the public? People are concerned about inflation. In fact, I say the top three issues in this election are inflation, inflation, and inflation. And after you address inflation, then you can talk about the issue near and dear to your heart. And if it's education or some of the other topics we've talked about, that's a winning issue. But you have to start with inflation. However, uh, you don't have to explain how it happens. I, Steve Moore and I have this discussion all the time. He wants people to understand why inflation happens and what the process is. No, what people need to understand is they go to, the, to fill their tank and they can't afford it. Or they, if they do afford that, then they go to the grocery store and they can't afford that. The biggest thing that people do when they face inflation is they fill their gas tank and when gas prices go up, they spend less on groceries. And for people who are a little bit more affluent, the biggest thing they cut back on is going out to eat. These are real world discussions. What we need to do is connect what is happening in policy to what people are experiencing in their life. In West Virginia this past year, we found that 76% of voters believe that higher government spending leads to higher gas prices. 
That's the inflation story we need to tell. And I think I'm out of time. So on that note, thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage, Alec Chief Executive Officer, Lisa B. Nelson. Thank you, Scott. Now, we love our partnership with Scott and appreciate his insights, and I can never get enough of him. So as much as you can stay as a partner with Alec, we want you. Um, picking up on some of the themes from yesterday, we all know that global trade can have significant benefits for the US and the world economy. But it is as important to understand the extent to which trade with certain nations could be compromising our economic and national security interests of the United States. As this video will show, trade with the hostile foreign nations may not always ensure to the benefit of our country. Do we have the video? Nope. We'll show it in a minute. How's that? Why don't I do this? I'll introduce our panel because um, the, the discussion yesterday and the fact that we had standing room only at the ESG panel after Vivek Ramaswamy tells us, this, tells us that the ESG and investment issue is a critical one for our legislators to understand. So to discuss this in greater detail, I'm excited to introduce the following guests for our panel discussion. And I promise we'll get that video for you in a minute. Will Hild is the Executive Director of Consumers Research. Will has a decade of nonprofit legal and public policy experience. Prior to joining Consumers Research, Will served as the Deputy Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project, and before that, he worked at the Philanthropy Roundtable as Director of External Affairs and CEO for the Culture and Freedom Initiative. Jessica Anderson is the Executive Director of Heritage Action for America. She has over a decade of policy and grassroots experience at the both the state and national levels as a presidential appointee, grassroots organizer, campaign advisor, and spokesperson. As executive director, Anderson leads Heritage Action's 2 million grassroots activists and 20,000 sentinels to engage directly with their state and federal lawmakers advocating for policy solutions. She previously served as Associate Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Office of Management and Budget for President Trump. And in 2017, she was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 uh, list for law and policy. And I'm proud to say she's now a Virginia native as opposed to a Maryland native. Welcome to the stage, Will Hild and Jessica Anderson. BlackRock, the biggest American money manager. Where are they investing your money? China, pouring in billions, propping up Chinese communist leaders, putting money into surveillance companies used by the Chinese military. Even left-wing billionaire George Soros knows BlackRock is harming U.S. national security. CEO Larry Fink loves to tell Americans how to live, but he negotiated against America, sucking up to China. BlackRock, taking your money, betting on China. Wow. That's incredible. And, and as many legislators that I talked to, talked to yesterday who said they had never heard of ESG, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really alarming what's been going on. And I think Jessica and Will both know that Alex has been at the tip of the spear of this cancel culture and kind of the questioning of corporate investments and things like that. So I'm loving to have this conversation and really happy to see the, the level of interest from our legislators. Will, um, given the record attendance yesterday at the workshop, which was literally standing room only and turning people at the door, um, the subject is clearly on the minds of just about everyone. So let's dive right into this. BlackRock and Investment Management Fund and its founder, Larry Fink, as we saw in the video, have been in the news and are being condemned by people as diverse as West Virginia Treasurer uh, Riley Moore, who came out yesterday with big news and George Soros, which is quite interesting. What about BlackRock makes it more controversial and potentially more dangerous than other investment firms? Absolutely, well, um, 
BlackRock, as you noted, is the largest uh, in the world uh, up until they lost uh, more client money than any firm ever in six months. They managed $10 trillion. It's down to about eight and a half now. So you had an impact. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and they use that money. Uh, you know, it's not their money. Uh, Larry Fink's wealthy, but he's not that wealthy. Uh, basically to serve their own political interests. And basically, it's a, a one-two punch against the American consumer and Amer the American citizen. Here domestically, they push ESG investing to hamper uh, corporations, um, micromanage their operations, push them towards very destructive net zero policies. That's here domestically. That raises costs for consumers at the grocery store, at the pump, and everywhere in between. In China, they flood mainland China and companies owned by CCP often with investment capital, and they don't push any of the same ESG nonsense there that they do here. And there's a reason for that is because if they did, they'd get kicked out of the country. They help funnel US investment dollars into that country in order to get quid pro quo favors from the government there. Uh, I know we noted in the commercial that uh, it even went as far as during the Trump administration, uh, Larry Fink actually helped advise Chinese officials in their trade negotiations against America. I mean, this guy's out actually advising foreign adversaries on, on our trade ne negotiations, and he gets, he gets a return on his investment. BlackRock has been given the right to run the only wholly foreign-owned mutual fund in mainland China. He recent, it's been recently uh, reported that, uh, by uh, Chinese news. Ironically, they've been given the right to be the only foreign f uh, uh, firm that manages pension funds in mainland China. So he's clearly getting a return on investment. The problem is that the favor that he's, he's giving them is selling out our country. And he's using ESG to do that. Yeah, that's fascinating. I hope Americans are watching. Jessica, to bring you into the conversation, it seems to be particularly acute in the energy industry. Mm. Um, surrounded by climate change as ESG actors push divestiture of energy companies from state pensions, uh, while the pensions maintain Chinese enterprises in their investments. ESG doesn't disadvantage these Chinese firms, as Will was talking about, because they don't disclose their environmental tactics. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how that works and why we should be concerned? Absolutely, and, and thank you, Lisa, for, for having us this morning, and, and frankly, for the room to be willing to tackle a really difficult and complex issue. So, um, I think the principles that are at play here that Will described are probably the first place to start when understanding the impact of the CCP in using the weakness of the ESG model to go after American energy and American fossil fuels. And so if you think about why would China, why would the CCP care about the American en energy industry? Why would they put it first, environmental, social governance? Why would that be first? Well, a weak American energy system, a weak American uh, business and financial markets only empowers the CCP both in their long-term goals here in the United States, but also how the United States um, acts and governs with international financial markets. And so their first target really was the environmental and energy industries here in the United States. And they found a willing partner, unfortunately, in the Biden administration because of how the Biden um, energy crew, their mafia, how they view American energy. They don't want our own sources of energy to be independent here in the United States. And so here comes the ESG movement and it says, look, we're gonna go and we're gonna, provide, we're gonna require credit scores um, for fossil fuel companies. We're gonna require all of these different mandates that are entirely unreachable for American energy businesses. And then that actually dilutes the market because more businesses have to pull out, they, can't, they can no longer compete, they get a low credit rating score, whatever the reason becomes, and then that allows more foreign dependence for our American energy sources than what we could provide here in the United States. And what's interesting about, about this kind of ESG shadow movement and the tentacles, it's not just the financial market, it's not just the energy, it overlaps and has that nexus with both the federal and the state governments. And so when you had Biden come in and you had his energy secretary going through nominations saying, we're gonna take down American energy independence, that was not a coincidence. When you have Biden's head of the SEC wreaking havoc on our markets on the bequest of the ESG social justice warrior movement, 
Those things are, are not by coincidence. And so um, starting at the beginning of just transparency of what the heck is going on in our country is, is frankly, it's the first step here, Lisa. And it's really the first thing, I think, to connecting the dots of how prolific, how prolific uh, the ESG movement backed by CCP is here in the United States. Yeah, it's, it seems particularly poignant this week as we see Nancy Pelosi, who I think most of America supported a trip led by her to go to Taiwan. That's right. And to show our support. My old boss, Newt Gingrich, came out publicly and said, yes, the Speaker of the House should lead a delegation and go. And just yesterday or the day before, we hear from China that that would pose a threat and Biden backs down. It's just surprising. You touched on it a little, Will, but I'm wondering uh, where does Larry Fink get his money? Absolutely. And, and how long has he been building this, you know, I mean, Vivek talked a little bit about um, his new investment fund, but how long has Larry Fink been working on this? It's a, it's a great question. And I've, we have uh, some ads uh, coming out that'll explain sort of the origin story of, of Larry a little bit more. He's strangely been connected to pretty much every bad economic thing that's happened to us in the last uh, you know, 20 years. He actually helped pioneer mortgage-backed securities. We all know how that ended. Um, and then, in fact, he profited from that, uh, from the 2008 crisis to build BlackRock. He got some of the sweetest assets out of the TARP program that helped him uh, form the foundation of BlackRock. But then what he basically turned BlackRock into was a vacuum to hoover up pension funds. So state, local, uh, even the federal, about 80% of the federal thrift savings plan is managed by BlackRock. And he built a firm that's around economies of scale. So he really pushed into pa the passive investing trend, a very low expense ratio fund so that he could hoover up all these assets because he knew that with the assets came the power. Right. He could come and he could meet with CEOs and he could say, listen, I'm your largest shareholder. And if you don't do what I say, I will punish you at the next shareholder vote, at the next shareholder meeting. Maybe I drop you from our ESG indexes. Your stock goes down. And they brag about this. They brag about, they were just in Nebraska presenting to the Nebraska pension fund uh, trustees there. And they presented on the thousands upon thousands of what they call engagements. That means meetings that they have with American CEOs telegraphing their politics and saying, if you don't do what we say. And one thing I'd just like to, to, to note on, uh, uh, in addition to what uh, Jessica just said, that, that it's ESG is built by its supporters, like Larry Fink, as an investment strategy. It is not an investment strategy. That's it is a disinvestment strategy. Mm -hmm. It is taking companies like Exxon and getting them out of the business of investing in oil and gas discovery and recovery. There are no moonshots coming out of this. This is ESG is not going to create cold fusion or you know make a, a you know our next round of of, of energy technology. What they're going to do is simply take our existing technologies and destroy them. Yeah, it's fascinating. I've seen the destruction of Exxon as a company, and it started with the infiltration of creating an advisory board on climate, and then those same people got to be on the board, and it took you know, three, four years to kind of matriculate into the, into the C-suite, but they've done it. And now you've got Exxon supporting a, a carbon tax and mm -hmm. things that will essentially destroy their business. Um, you know, you talked about transparency, Jessica, and us kind of understanding how this is all working and what the threat is. And at ALEC, we've got a, a model policy to make sure that we keep politics out of pension funds and those, uh, those funds that are invested by the states. I think everybody in the room knows that we had nine, I think nine state treasurers and have partnered with Derek Kreifels at SFOF, the State Financial Officers Foundation, to work alongside with our legislators and the state treasurers. The treasurers have been really, really bold about coming out. I know last night, uh, Treasurer Moore was on Laura Ingram on this issue, but what can state legislators do um, you know, you've got a room full of them, and I know that after yesterday's session, we had at least five states rush up to Jonathan Williams and say, I want to, I want to carry this Great. bill in my state. But what, what specifically are we looking for, and how can we educate our legislators better on this issue to take action? Yeah. So what's, what's great is that Alec and the task forces here are taking this issue head on. And it's something that both the state treasurers have a, have a piece of the puzzle, state lawmakers do, as well as governors. And so there's really kind of two buckets of work that can, that can come from this discussion here today. 
Um, the first is actually the messaging and how we talk about this issue. So Scott made such a great point this morning that you, you know, we have all of this technical jargon, <laughs> basically that, that, uh, that defines a really complex issue like this. We need to break it down. Do you want the CCP to be buying up land in your state, to be handling all of your businesses, to be the, the, the boogeyman behind the curtain? Are those the things that American voters, that everyday average Americans want? Absolutely not. Do they know what ES, a ESG credit model score is? No. So state lawmakers, leaders at the state level, they can talk about this issue in very common sense terms that protect the customer, the voter, the American citizen in the United States. And so just getting out there, discussing it, being on, being on the stump, actually leading on this is, is really kind of the first thing that everyone can do, regardless of your political makeup in your state. The second piece of this is the, is the actual legislative tools that are available to state lawmakers now because of the great work by so many people in this room to understand this issue and really harden the defenses that's what we're doing here, right? We're hardening the defenses of state governments against the threat of the CCP and how they use ESG. And so there are three things. We've actually, I brought this up with me just to point it out. Um, there's, there's a little dock on everyone's um, seat as well as some flyers in the back that, that will get you started. This is the framework that we're recommending in concert with the work at ALEC to each of you in this room today. And it does three things that states can do, specifically state lawmakers, representatives and senators. One, protects those state pensions and investments that, that Lisa and Will talked about. Do it in a way that the state investments are protected for the state's interests. ESG and the CCP, they don't care about jobs. They don't care about the livelihood of Americans. States have a vested interest as a customer to these companies in protecting it. So it is, it is well within the confines of how we would view the free market and protecting the interests of Americans. Forget the national security threat, put that over there, but just talk specifically about the economic benefits in the state. So that's one, and we've got some great model legislation to get you started as a framework for how to tackle this issue through your state committees uh, in this upcoming state legislative session in, in 2023. The second thing state lawmakers can do is to protect state contracts. Now, this has come up a lot over the last two years. Texas was out front um, in having a, a pretty bold and aggressive uh, model uh, legislation that went through their state legislature last year that specifically got at the fossil fuel angle of this, and it said that a state the state will not do business with any company that lifts up this ESG model above the interests of Texans as it relates to fossil fuels in particular. And so again, going back to the principle here that we want to protect American interests, we want to protect state contracts in a way that, that beefs up the American consumer and, and hardens that defense against, against the CCP into our country. And then the third thing is to support those executive offices. And so states have the ability to pass resolutions, which would actually empower executive officials, empower treasurers to basically use their authority, including what we believe is administrative action here, to protect the interests of the state and to get this ESG um, woke thinking out of our companies, out of our states, in a way that actually protects the American consumer, protects our businesses, and ultimately protects us from the threat of communist China. So those are the three things, and they're, they're all outlined here, and I think it's a great place for this room to really start and to grapple with this issue, and I think we're gonna build a lot more from here, Lisa. I feel like we're right, um, we're right at the tipping point, right? We're at the, at the cliff here, getting ready to jump off and do something really extraordinary to protect American interests for years to come. Uh, yeah, those are all great points. And the thing that I've noticed in talking to a lot of people, and, and we've been at this for a long time, is that this seems to be, and I, I think I heard that there was some polling out on that would, that would support this, that seems to be an issue where, as I mentioned, George Soros and, yeah, uh, and, and conservatives agree. Is this, is this a bipartisan issue? Is this something where Democrats, especially where it's focused on China, is this something that Democrats can do? And then to add on to that, have we caught this in time? You know, I, I, you mentioned the impact that you're starting to have. You know, is there, is there a possibility that this could shift on its own through market forces? Absolutely. So we do polling, but you know, we're engaged in a multi-million dollar ad campaign against BlackRock. We've spent 
$3.5 million so far fighting them and we're gonna spend as much as it takes because the threat is, is so big. And obviously we do polling before so we can understand. And one of the things that really was amazing about the polling was that the threat of pension, US pension funds being used to build up communist China was across the board enraging mm. to everyone. I think something like 75% of the Democrats said that they were somewhat or very concerned about that issue if they were to find out that their pension fund was being used to build up communist China. So absolutely, this is an issue that can be used across the board. Independence, it's even higher. Secondly, as far as whether we've caught it in time, obviously uh, they have some huge advantages. They've been building this for a long time, over a decade. That said, it is a very fragile machine that they have built and they have built it under our noses and they've gotten very little pushback up until now, up until the last 12 to 18 months. As soon as you've started to see pushback, the thing has started to fall apart. You have Larry Fink walking back a lot of his prior statements. He, he puts out an annual letter to CEOs. And then if you go back and read 2008s, to, or 2018s, 2019s, 20, you know, it, it's just, you know, you need to be doing this and this woke stuff and that woke stuff. We launched last October our ad campaign by January He's saying in his letter, listen, 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 I'm not woke. He said that in his letter. So they are very nervous. I want to explicitly <laughs> say they are already clearly in violation of almost every state's fiduciary laws based on how pension funds have to be managed. They realize that they are way out ahead of their skis in front of this, and we really just need to drive the point on we need to finish it off and kill this thing because it poses a huge danger, but it is illegal, it is a violation of their fiduciary duty. Um, and we just need to, to enforce laws and, and, and strengthen them. And as Jessica said, use ex executive actions as well because pensioners retirements that are at risk, consumers uh, are at risk as far as the prices they're paying. So it, re it really matters. But I, I do think we've caught this thing in time. We just need to, we just need to push forward. Yeah, Jessica, do you want to jump in? I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly that we've we've caught this in time. And I would just offer a, a, a note of encouragement for the room. It may have taken the CCP and 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 frankly, we a weak America um, with the social justice movement. You know, they they caught fire, right? They they caught onto a movement that they only could have dreamed of to then infiltrate the United States. And that may have taken over 10 years for them to build you know, a decade's worth of work and the tentacles across the country. We don't have a decade to stop it. So, so kind of knowing that it took them that long, recognizing that we have to act now, we have to act aggressively and smartly to, to not only stunt it, but then hopefully put it in a, put the United States in a position of leadership where then we can ward off any future efforts here to, to weaken the United States. I mean, that would really be, I think, the clarion call for this room to go back, to go into 2023 with a mindset to be aggressive, to use the transparency of, of Will's ad campaign, to get that around and really go at this thing because we don't have a decade to fix it. We've caught it in time, but we don't have as long, you know, we don't have 10 years. We've got all kids and grandkids and America businesses that are certainly hurting from this as we've already seen already. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the Larry Fink letter and uh, we tracked Larry Fink's annual letter for about six years and, and it always said the shareholder value, mm -hmm. shareholder value. And I think it was back in 2016 that in that letter, and we couldn't believe it when we discovered this, but he changed the word from shareholder to stakeholder. Mm. And we knew at that moment, I mean, it's very subtle, but it's like the difference, as Scott was talking about, between equality and equity. Changing that word from shareholder, meaning you, the shareholders of that company, to stakeholder, meaning the people who are going to try to influence mm -hmm. those investments, means you're now no longer in charge of your own you know, if, if you think about it, your portfolio, right. um, your investment portfolio. So very, very interesting. Um, the, there's Larry Fink and BlackRock can't be the only bad actors, and I don't want to name other names here, but it, are there other things that, tr that our legislators should be looking at? And if your treasurer isn't engaged on this issue as legislators, you might want to look at that and either talk about policy solutions legislatively or maybe make a phone call to your state treasurer and say, hey, why aren't you looking into some of these things in terms with our state's investments? 
Any other any other actors? Any other things that we should be? Yeah, absolutely. At? The the large banks are also a huge problem in that. Uh, J P Morgan Chase, Citibank have taken uh, public stances that they are you know targeting Paris Accord you know net zero targets. So they're starting to restrict. This is what you alluded to with uh, State Treasurer Moore, uh, or West Virginia uh, Treasurer Moore, pushing back on that. And the insurance companies as well have strangely uh, taken this up. So this is something that needs to be dealt with across the board. BlackRock is the poster child of it. Larry Fink is by far the worst offender. But these banks need to be reined in. Uh, these insurance companies need to be reined in. Uh, so absolutely, it's, it's, it's got to be looked at at a broad base. Well, thank you very much. I think we're out of time. But um, this conversation, um, I think, is, as, as Jessica said, we're right on the precipice of, of this discussion. And we need to keep exploring it and learning more about how we can make an impact. And we really, really appreciate all the work that both of your organizations are doing. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Please give our panel Thank a you. Hand. We don't want to scare you too much, but we just need to bring this to your attention. Thank you so much, Will and Jessica. I really appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, our next speaker, to follow on that fabulous discussion, is someone who understands how to work well in the states, galvanizing citizens across Georgia, and making sure that grassroots uh, are working effectively with grass tops, which is such an important element. Kelly Loeffler is the former U.S. Senate Senator and Chair of Greater Georgia, an organization working to register and reach and activate more eligible voters in communities across the Peach State. Greater Georgia is also engaging communities that feel left out of the political process, some of those rural areas across Georgia, and restoring trust and integrity in the election process. Please welcome Kelly Loeffler. Thank you for that warm welcome. Welcome to Georgia. I know we've got so many visitors here, and you have to be careful because I was once visiting Georgia at a convention, and 10 years later I moved here. So I hope you all will consider that. Now, just as a break, because Chancellor Perdue led us in that beautiful prayer, I'd love to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance because I think it's really important on the heels of that panel to understand what's at stake. It's our country. So if you all don't mind, can we stand and Say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. I, uh, yeah, well, we can still do that in Georgia. So, it, it was wonderful to have Chancellor Purdue open us in prayer this morning. As you heard, in 2002, he became the first Republican governor since Reconstruction here in Georgia. So when, as a great farmer from South Georgia, Governor Purdue stood up for our state, it marked the beginning of a new era with a vision for what was possible. And in a short amount of time, we became a much more prosperous state. 2002 was also significant to me for another reason. At the same time Sonny became Governor Purdue, I moved here to Georgia to work for a small startup company. That startup eventually became an incredible success story. And isn't creating more success stories why we're all here today? Strong, conservative policy at the state and local level can create millions more success stories and drive access to more opportunities. And in fact, opportunity is a huge part of my Georgia story. In the 10 years before I moved here, I lived in five different cities after graduating from college. I pursued my MBA and I climbed the ladder in financial services. I moved from LA to Kansas City to Chicago to New York and Dallas. But Georgia was different. When I took a risk to join a startup 20 years ago, our company had just 100 employees. We worked day and night because we had a vision for what was possible, just like all of you here do. 
Not only was our business able to find its footing here in this great state to eventually employ thousands and to become a Fortune 500 company, but I found a state that respects American values, that is pro-family, that is pro-faith, that is pro-freedom. While our business grew and we acquired companies around the country and around the world, including acquiring the New York Stock Exchange, we never, ever considered leaving this great state. Being in Georgia was a competitive advantage and the best place in the country to live. But I can tell you from my experience, the contrast between Washington and Georgia is stark. Georgians know it too, 78% of us Georgians say the country's heading in the wrong direction. And I'm sure that's true in your state too. This is where the power of federalism comes in. We've seen the contrast between red states and blue states like never before. In terms of playing out in their governing philosophy, Georgia's a proud red state and we govern for people. We put opportunity within everyone's reach. And indeed, part of great policy is giving people from all walks of life the chance to live the American dream. That begins with states who focus on helping job creators, also known as businesses, large and small. They provide that teenager's first job bussing tables at a restaurant, or the college graduate's first corporate job at a manufacturing company or those returning to school in order to switch careers. And I know that all of this works because each of those steps were on my path. Building a healthy business environment and creating the opportunities that bring everyone up starts with a focus on education, economic development, and a skilled workforce. Our legislators have also here cut taxes at both the corporate and individual level while balancing the budget and creating a budget surplus. With a vital international logistics corridor, vast real estate, low commercial energy rates, and fewer regulations, you can see why Georgia has been the number one place in the country to do business for eight years running. Today, 18 Fortune 500 companies call Georgia home, and we're sixth in the nation for small business. We have over a half million women-owned businesses, and a quarter of our businesses are minority owned. 20 years ago, Georgia's leadership position on a world and international stage was not assured. But it's a textbook example of what's possible when states have a vision for prosperity and commit to limiting the reach of government and to promoting free enterprise. So you may know me as a former, state, a former senator from the state of Georgia, but you may not know that I grew up on a family farm in rural Illinois. I worked my way up from waitressing, uh, from working in our cattle lot, from working in our fields, and I was the first in my family to graduate from college. I then became a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, a sports team owner, and a philanthropist. But I started out with that, on that family farm with only a dream of succeeding in business and the work ethic and determination to make it happen. I realized my dream of working in financial services for more than two decades, and then I became a chief executive of a digital asset startup. But sadly, I was one of the few senators in Washington that actually had any business experience, and I was the only member of Congress to have an MBA and a CFA. I understand how to read a balance sheet, something those in Washington rarely do. Still, today, with hard work and faith, the American dream is possible for all. But over the years, we've seen that dream become much more challenging, particularly in blue states that put up needless roadblocks to educational success or to career success, and they create dependency along the way. The growth of government is robbing Americans of their liberty by encroaching in all aspects of our lives. When, in fact, we know the private sector can often do better at solving our problems. And I saw the process and consequences both in Washington and in the private sector and can assure you the federal government programs, spending and picking winners and losers is not the answer. In fact, it's the root of the problems that we have here today. 
Fiscal discipline has been replaced with endless new legislation and executive orders that take trillions in taxpayer dollars that they worked so hard for, and that's just in the last 18 months. Monetary policy is now a political football. And look at today's debate on inflation and the definition of a recession. So the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet to $9 trillion while ignoring the inflationary effects of this administration's Green New Deal, it poses unprecedented risks that we are not sure we're prepared for. And as high and as fast as interest rates have risen in recent months, we still have negative real interest rates and 9% inflation. So that means rates are set to go higher and higher in the coming months. And similarly, we saw the, the blue state fallout during COVID. Endless lockdowns, small business closing, Americans leaving the workforce, and expecting the government to step in in the income gap. That, de that dependency creates more control by the government in our lives. It increases the power of the administrative state through taxation and bureaucracy. And the more regulation and legislation we push through, the less freedom and opportunity that we all have. So with today's labor participation rate well below pre-pandemic levels, we now have a shortage of workers, spiraling wages that still haven't kept pace with the rise in consumer prices. But the fact is, and the bottom line really is, that states like Georgia are the last line of defense. By leading with common sense policies that preserve local control and democratic values, we can protect our country at the state level. And that's why I'm so thrilled that Alec is here with us today in Georgia. When you uphold conservative principles, limited government, free enterprise, free markets, federalism, you become a great place to live, to work, and raise a family. And I saw as an executive at one of Georgia's top job creators and as a senator, the remarkable growth that people-centered policies can have on the state and the damage that can be done in states that focus on politics instead of people. And that's why state legislators are so vital in people's lives. But I'm desperately concerned that they are underappreciated. It's why I now work every single day to elect common sense officials at the state and local level. Through my organizations, Greater Georgia and Citizens for Greater Georgia, we're ringing the alarm on the importance of state and local elections and our policy right here at home. I know there's a lot of focus in Washington, but I'm confident that here locally, we can make a huge difference by activating citizens to get involved, to learn about policies and the politicians that affect their everyday lives. Those of us here are really best positioned to bring that mindset of growth back to our states and create more opportunity for more people. We can either get mired in debating the bad policy of the left and, fi and fighting culture wars, or we can go on offense and set an unapologetic agenda that restores our strength, our freedoms, and our normalcy in America. And each of you has the power to propel prosperity, to protect the American dream in your state with pro-growth policies that lift more Americans up rather than holding them back, I know that together we'll cre create millions of more success stories in this great country. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Please welcome back to the stage, Karen Fan. Well, it is really good to hear that we have some elected officials in D.C. that actually understand business and how the country works. So it's interesting. This morning, Steve Moore happened to make comment there were 63 high-level cabinet members in D.C. that have zero business experience. I guess that understands why we're in the mess that we're in right now. Thank you to all of our speakers and panelists. We have a number of substantial and engaging task force meetings this afternoon. Specifically, the following task force will be meeting at 9.15.
Communications and Te Technology, Commerce, Insurance, and Economic Development, Criminal Justice, Tax, and Fiscal Policy. Have a great morning, and we'll see you all back here at lunch. Thanks for coming. Thank you.